Hello. Hello, Tech Talk Worldwide. And hello, Tracy Boyle. Hi, how are you going? Good. Thank you so much for taking some time away of what we know of your busy schedule to be able to come join us and uh, share some of your um, life experiences and what I call nerdy nail knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, happy to be here today, Amy, and thank you um, very much for asking me to join you. Um, it's always my pleasure to talk to other nail techs. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you've been in the industry for many, many years like I have. And so being able to network over the years with a lot of other techs has kind of advanced both of us in our careers. And so that's it's fabulous to be able to share like that. Um, so I always like to start off with how did you get started in the nail industry? Oh, wow. You're asking me to go back a long, long time. Oh, and that'll be giving out my age, Amy. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I actually um, lost my mum and dad at a really young age. Um, I lost my mum when I was... 28-ish. Um, she'd been sick for a very, very, very long time um, and then lost my dad two years later. So it was quite a devastating time for me um, and needed a change of direction. And I remember one day being in a friend's salon, um, having my legs waxed, as you do, and yeah. she said to me, you know, Trace, I think you would make a really good therapist. And I thought about it and I thought, hmm, yeah, I think I could do that. So mentioned it to a few other friends and said to them, what do you think? And they were like, oh, yeah. And I thought, how come everyone else sees this and I can't? So I took a night class and wax and as you do, and I thought, yeah, I really, really enjoy doing this. So I signed up for the full program, which is in the UK called a HND. And at that time, it was over five years. So I did all the facial classes, all the waxing classes, the manicure classes. And then we got to the false nail class, as they called it then. Yeah. And once I got that acrylic brush in my hand, that was game over. I didn't <laughs> want to be this therapist anymore. I just wanted to be this nail technician. Um, I think because you can see um, an instant result, not only on the client's nails, but also the client's face, you know, because they, they look at you and they get so excited. And yes, yeah, so that was a game over nail tech. Not this fantastic <laughs> therapist that I planned, but um, yeah, so that's what kind of drove me to go and find um, a different direction. Um, just purely because life's too short to be doing something that you're not entirely happy doing. So yeah. Yeah, I would say anybody is to go and find out what where your happy place is. And um, certainly a happy place for me, apart from my kids, is nails. So yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's 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 unfortunate that you had to lose your parents to be able to kind of restructure your life to say, you know what, life is short and to be able to move on and I'm quite sure that they'd be very proud of you after all these years of what you've been able to accomplish in the industry. And so I'm sorry about your parents. Oh, thanks, Amy. Yeah. So when you first became a tech, did you like go into a salon? Did you team up with friends and, you know, kind of open your own? How did, what did you do? Well, first of all, as you do when you come out, you go and you work, you know, in a salon to get your experience up because let's face it, that's, that's where you learn your craft is on the floor in a salon, not so much in school or nail school. It's it's more on the floor. You've got to go through that process. Um, mm -hmm. So I did that for, for a period of time. And then I um, found out I was pregnant with um, twin boys. <laughs> um, they came into... <laughs> They're now 14, they're big boys now. Um, so they came into my life and at that point I thought, you know, I need some more stability. So if that wasn't enough work for me, I decided to open my own salon. Yeah, um, yeah there was myself, um, five girls, um, 
and my sister <laughs> and my big cousin used to come in and be the tea ladies because we were just so busy. I used to call them in the morning and say, oh, we're so busy. And they was like, yeah, yeah, we'll come down. So they doubled as reception and the tea ladies, being the coffee ladies. Um, I couldn't have done it without them, definitely not. Um, so yeah, I did that for for a period of time and I sold my salon before I moved out to Australia. Um, but in like the midst of all that, I was still teaching um, at college at night. So I was teaching night classes. I only went there to do maternity leave, would you believe? <laughs> And they kept me there, yeah, for a number of years. So yeah, it was it was good. The I find when um, so years ago when I first got out of school, so my parents, my mom owned a salon and all of that, and so I I was kind of like put into the salon role, I think, from birth. Yeah. And yeah. having so, my children. Oh, sorry, Amy, if that came up. I can't look at the comments. I was trying to look at the comments. I've put it down. <laughs> <laughs> and so when um so when I had children I just assumed that my daughter would want to be a nail tech and then my son would want to be you know into the industry like my grandfather was a barber and stuff and the reality is that neither one of them want anything to do with this they appreciate it and they've hung out in the salon since they were a baby but they um they just don't have the desire to continue on in this. My daughter wants to go into hygienist and my son's a pharmacist. So they both took off to the medical side of it. So um, with your sons being in the industry and growing up in the industry as well and your children, how do they feel? Do you see them staying in the industry and moving on your legacy? Um, no, I don't, I don't know so much. They loved it when they were younger. I've got lots of um, photographs of them when they were younger, in fact, um if there's any ex-students tuning in who will know that they used to turn up in class time mm -hmm. um right about lunch time they used to come and deliver the lunch um and the ladies in the salon used to love that as well um but i don't see them actually doing anything to do with nails although one of them has a very creative side mm -hmm. um he very clever wee boy but is into the arts a lot you know like drawing dancing music all that sort of thing um and the other ones are down and out right soccer player so no interest at all <laughs> now in anything that's um to do with mom and her nails although even to this day uh, they still love it when my ladies are here they like chatting to my ladies and right charmers so I think that would set them in good stead with the girls you know um when they're older to be able to chat away to the girls yeah yeah oh that's so fun my son I I know that he would hate that I told this story but when he was oh, I want to say about eight or nine years old um he used to beg to paint my client's toenails and um <laughs> You would totally die that I tell you this. It's so funny. And so when the clients would come in and they at the time would pick out their nail polish color, they he would be like, Do you want your toes to match? Like he had a total setup and a total like spill of how to sell it, how to sell himself on it. And and of course, you know, we didn't charge for whatever. But one time Michael from State Boards walked in and he saw my son down on the floor polishing one of her clients' toenails. And I'm quite sure he probably thought child labor law, right? But the <laughs> thing that he knew me and knew that that was not the case and I said um uh he goes you you know that he can't be doing that and I said I know I said it was so hard because he really wanted to do it and my client was like yes and so anyways he kind of you know pointed his finger like I'm gonna look the other way and I'm gonna go inspect over here but pretty much by the time he got back it needed to be picked up and so <laughs> I hurriedly it up and it came back over and my son remembers that still and he just is like oh my gosh it's so funny though but he did he used to paint the ladies toenails so when they came in to get their nails done <laughs> oh, cute. the ladies loved it though 
Oh, absolutely, they did. And I, I'm saddened that it's actually against the law, but you know, <laughs> so many times if we could bring in our families a little bit more, we want to support that. Like if I walked into a little, you know, boutique and there was, you know, a little girl there helping her mom fold the clothes or something like that, I would want to support that more. And so, it, you know, it is sad that we kind of have to separate our families a little bit. However, to stay on the professional side, sometimes our children need to be in the salon as well. <laughs> You know, I think being around the salon for kids as well is it's a good um a good life lesson for them because they learn how to be um good socially, if that makes sense, is to to be able to chat to, to older um mature people and you know, hold a conversation. Um I know for my boys, I don't know about yours, but they're more chatterboxes now. So like when somebody's there, they will. They're like social butterflies. So yeah. they, they learn that from an early age. And I think the salon environment for girls or boys, little ones, it, it's a great, a great learning um, experience for them to learn them to be a bit more sociable. So yeah, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So hey, speaking of being young and doing different things, um, you shared with me that you used to be a baton twirler. Oh, Amy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I love it. I Maybe it set you in the, because I used to be able to like twirl it between my fingers too. But maybe it set you in the market of working with your hands, right? Yeah, well, again, like being a nail technician, um, let's face it, we've all heard this. Oh, your nails are amazing. Who did them for you? I did them. Yeah, that's true. How, but how did you do your other hand? Because I can. <laughs> but I think I danced from the, as you know, right, so my secret's out now. I danced from the age of three till I was 27 and I was in a really bad car accident, which they thought I would never walk again from. But um, I got over that hurdle. But my years of dance, being a baton twirler, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, I like to use two at the same time. I was never that talented. <laughs> but I a twirler too. <laughs> so not only did I compete um, in the one baton competitions, but um, the double baton competitions. So what that hand could do, that hand could do. <laughs> so it just does both do the same. So I think um, all those years of baton twirling and making both hands do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, what this one can do, that one can do. So it doesn't make any difference to me. So I think that really set me up for being a nail technician. Um, so I can do my not so dominant hand. Yeah. Um, so I have, I don't, I don't really have like a dominant hand. Like, oh, my stars. Sorry, Amy. Decline. Somebody's trying to call me. <laughs> it's real life. That's what it is. Oh, my stars. <laughs> I think it's somebody saying that they can't join. They're trying to join the, um, cause she just sent me a message there. She's trying to join the live feed, but she's not a member of the group. Well, I, as you're talking, I will take care of that. Oh, awesome. So yeah, I think, I think all those years of, um, yeah, being able to do the baton twirling. And I think, you know, there's probably lots of checks out there. If I actually done that, I don't know so much about um, UK techs or Australian techs, but certainly American techs because it's very American thing to do. Yeah, um, my mom was a baton twirler because you had a choice to either be a baton twirler and you can be in all the parades or like a banner carrier, or you could be a cheerleader, but cheerleaders were only for certain sports. And so, oh. if you really wanted to be a part of everything, you had to be a baton twirler or a banner carrier. So uh -huh. we were like higher up than the cheerleaders. Oh, <laughs> so I was an in girl. Thing, like shorty shorts and skirts and stuff like that. <laughs> and your boots and your hat. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly that. It's funny. Oh, I miss yeah. those days. They were really fun, but, you know, you have to grow up at some point and, yeah. Yeah. So do you find that some of the things that you did in your past helped you along and through the career as a nail tech and you know you're talking about competitions and dance and you know we have competition in the nail industry and in fact you've judged and so therefore judging and being judged in dance and baton twirling and all of that do you ever find that any of those kind of cross link 
They definitely do, Amy. I think the the career path of being a dancer for so long um, and even judging dance at one point has certainly fallen over onto um, my career now because it seems to have gone, even though into the nail side of things, mm -hmm. I've been in my salon. I've been um, an educator for 10 years with young males. Um, and I just have to say this to start with that I owe an awful lot of my career in the nail industry to the boys, to Greg and Abe. Um, love those boys to absolutely moon and back, mm -hmm. um, along with um, Stephen George and his wife, Lisa, who sadly passed away a year ago there at Christmas. Um, they, they believed in me a way back then um, to give me a job as an educator for them. Um, and through that job as being an educator for them, um, Denise Shite, the lovely Denise Shite from the UK, again, she one day, as you do, another funny story, um, having breakfast in the morning before we go to the expo floor. As she's chatting away, she's getting her breakfast as we're waiting in line and I'm putting my breakfast on my plate. And I was like, sorry, what, what, did, you, did you just ask me that question there, Denise? And she went, yeah. She said, so will you? And I went, will I what? And she went, will you judge for me today? And I was like, oh, yeah, wow. Oh, I think I need to go and speak to Lisa and Steve first. And she went, okay then. So I went over to the table and I sat my breakfast down. I said, you'll never guess what's just happened to me. <laughs> and they're like, what? I said, oh, Denise Wright's just asked me to judge today. And they were like, and did you say yes? And I was like, oh, I never said anything. I said, I'd have to come and speak to you first. They're like, get back over there. I was like, oh, my stars. So that's how I started judging um, with Stu Denise wow. Wright. And I've been really yeah. lucky. You know, yeah. How many competitions do you think that you've judged? Oh my stars! No, I have no idea. I've judged quite a fair amount um, in the UK with Denise Wright and Rachel Meyer and Sue Davis, um, and running the competitions here um, in Australia as well. I well wouldn't even like to think because I've been doing that for seven years here. Mm -hmm. and been doing it 10 years and we be or more so probably 17 or thereabouts mm -hmm. <sighs> we've seen a lot of text rise and shine huh is yeah. there anybody in the industry that you you know you just kind of knew you know from the beginning like day one you were just like they're gonna be somebody have you ever seen kind of anything like that yeah, a few actually. I've I've been very, very, very lucky, Amy, to watch careers at the very, very ground grassroots level. Yeah. And now watch these girls and boys soar. And I feel privileged to be a part of that because I've I've been there every step of the way. Um and a lot of people don't realise that you, you've actually been there from the beginning with this person and you've known them their whole journey. Yeah. Um, it makes me feel old a little bit because some of them now have got kids of their own and, and you think, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> but yeah, lots, lots of amazing texts. Too many to mention around the world that I've watched. Um, and I've just been so lucky to be a part of their journey. Oh my goodness. I love stories like that because, you know, it's kind of funny that you say, you know, the, the boys and the girls, because just about a year ago, somebody said, can you believe that all these men are becoming nail techs? I'm like, becoming? Like our oh, industry yeah. has been founded through men being nail techs and right. men being, this is nothing new in our industry. I said, I remember 
going to, uh, you know, I hadn't met any men nail tech until I went to a competition. And then, oh my gosh, they're like half of the room was men. And, mm -hmm. and she was really, and I go, yeah. And that was a long time ago. I said, no, the men are the foundation of this industry and we need that diversity. And so she kind of didn't have anything to say after that. I think she was just kind of waiting for it to see if I was going to be like negative. Like I know they should be in construction and we need to be in the beauty industry, but you know what men no beauty and mm -hmm. women want to impress men and so when it comes down to it we need that diversity of the men and the women to make this industry grow and so I just always thought that was really funny when she said that because I thought no what no. you know we don't give them enough credit I think either in our industry because they're I don't want to say in the minority but they sort of are um mm -hmm. but definitely like they are amazing the, the the men that we have in our industry um you know and and they do um a lot a lot of good things for our industry um and putting it forward you, i mean you just need to look at like tommy Bacek and uh, john hawk and um tom holcomb god rest his soul but you, you just need to look at these these men and they have worked away you know, from that grassroots up to where they are today. Um, and they're good role models for the other men that are coming through. They definitely are. Absolutely. You know, and um, when we even talk about the true chemistry side of it and stuff too, you know, when it comes back to, I think it was like 1954, that a dentist, a male dentist used acrylic to put on his fingernail to be able to uh, fix it because he had hurt himself and to get to continue with his job and you know and then just even Doug Schoen you know the chemists behind a lot of these companies it's I we appreciate them so much for um I don't know for the foundation of what this industry is and to I don't know allow us women to shine as well I mean it's like it, like I think Kim uh, Menor uh, said this the other day is that a nail tech is my enemy we are all friends we all want to see each other thrive and to be able to soar to the top and and so it's just I, I love the dynamic of what we have and with social media now we have that a little bit more of an international type of uh, marketing that we can do with each other like you and I can be talking right now you are like so many hours in my future like, I know. Monday at 6 30 and your Tuesday morning at 10 30 yeah so I mean I once again I just every I say this every single tech talk I am so overwhelmed and blown away by how we can network um online like this it it's awesome a, yeah absolutely yeah I, I love the idea that you're in my future in many ways in my future yeah we get um Santa Claus before you and we get um the New Year's before you I think we first celebrate New Year's so yeah it's nice when we get up the next game morning and we can start watching the rest of the world celebrate it so we don't miss out on anything it's quite good you're just setting the standards for the rest of us <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's strange sometimes you do have to remind yourself that you are at the opposite end of the world I mean sometimes I actually pinch myself and I think I live here and then I think what were you thinking when you brought two six-year-olds here women you must have had a screw list at that point <laughs> but do you know what I've never looked back on it that way it was the right thing to do um for all reasons for my career for the boys for our family um and yeah, we, we all love it here, but it's nice to think that we can celebrate things before everybody else. And then we can watch everybody else celebrate it. So it's quite cool. <laughs> One of my um, girlfriends moved to Australia a few years ago. Her husband's in the oil field and she just recently moved back and she absolutely loved it there, everything about it. And I remember her talking about that there was, she was giving me a video tour of her home and that there was this rotter and fencing around the pool. And I said, um, oh, is that to like to keep the kids out? And she said, no, she said, you wouldn't believe my husband, Corey jumped in the pool. One, it's salt water. It's a salt water swimming pool. And I was like, 
why would you do that? Like that would be like swimming in the ocean, you know, she was with the fencing around to keep the crocodiles out. And I was like, I don't know that I can't go there. Oh my stars. So she yes. must have been in uh, the Northern Territory down yeah. here in New South Wales. We don't have a problem with um, the crocodiles, it's the snakes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, you know, I try not to think about it, Amy, because yeah. we're right next to the bush. My house, where my house is, is like when you open my front door, I look onto the bush. Um, and yeah, touch wood. I need to touch wood as I'm saying this to you. Um, I've not seen one. The kids yeah. have, and my husband has, and he even took pictures of it. He was out walking the dog one day. But um yeah, I try not to think about that aspect of it because <laughs> I think I would actually collapse in the spot. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh my um, God. no, I, I, I still want to come to Australia by all means. I want to be there. We actually have two admin on our Tech Talk Worldwide, and one's Jessica and Sammy, and they're from Australia. And of oh, course. Wow. You know, dying of the heat over there and I am probably in the middle of a blizzard getting about another eight inches of snow just today and so they're like I want to come there and play and I'm like I want to go there and just warm up well coming from a cold country like myself living in Scotland um yeah I think I prefer the heat much more than I do the cold and the snow the snow is pretty to look at it's nice but uh, that's about it. Like, I just mm -hmm. couldn't. I think if I had to go back into that environment now, I would actually die. I just couldn't cope with the cold. <laughs> um, there was yesterday, like Easter Sunday. We were wearing my to keep your short sleeves and the air conditioning on. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had a beach day yesterday um, with the dog and the kids. And yeah, it's just. Oh, that sounds wow. wonderful to me. Okay, so getting back to talking about nails, you know, we were talking about, you know, competitions and judging and stuff like that. And, you know, one of the things that I found when I used to compete, and, you know, you look at nail magazines and stuff like that, is that there's a big difference between salon nails and competition nails. And I don't think a lot of techs realize that when they go to competition that they need to know the difference of that because what they're judged on is so much different than what we do every day. And so, um, for instance, one of the big differences is you can have somebody who has a long, beautiful nail bed, and that's going to be your model that you use for your competition. But in the salon, those women don't tend to get their nails done. It's usually the short bitten nail that wants the transformation to look long. And so in in the industry of the, you know, the competition side of the nail industry, do you have any tips for some of these girls that might be going and competing for the first time? Well, the first tip I would give them is when you pack your case is to make sure that you have everything you need on there. Check it, check it again, have a tick list and keep checking that. Every time you get a minute, check it to make sure you've got everything you need on it. Um, silly things like having a little bit of acetone in a dappin dish beside you when you go to paint the nails so that you can clean under the nails with a little paintbrush to take off any you know, polish that's underneath there. It's a good thing to do. Um, but mainly I would say to them is enjoy it. Have fun, especially when you do it for the very first time because you get yourself all worked up about it and then that's when you you make those silly little mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, there's, there's not any, you know, fantastic big formula for it. Everybody has their own formula. Um, it's what works for you and what works for the person, your model that you have. Bringing it back to the model, um, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. You need to keep your model warm. You need to make sure she's got the long nail bed, nail plate um, to make sure that you, you know, get that one-to-one -one ratio if the competition requires it or one-to-one -one and a half ratio, the length to the nail bed. Um, and they're very different um, structure. Very, very, very different structure to what these girls and boys are doing every single day in the salon. In the salon, we are looking to do the perfect nail for that client that's going to last the client, that the client's going to get her two weeks out of, sometimes three weeks out of, and she's going to come back and have her fill. So she needs to have the structure and the strength there. 
the structure and the strength for um <laughs> I just see that pop up there. Um the structure and the strength for uh an actual real competition is a completely different ball game. You know, your concave, your convex, and then your C curve needs to be at least, you know, between 30-40%. They need to be credit card thin. Now these nails you would breathe on them the wrong way or file them the wrong way and they are going to collapse on you the yeah. pink collapse and i've seen that in competition I've, I've witnessed a competitor sitting there filing their heart out and the next minute the tip's gone and you're like oh and you can see it in their faces and they try everything so a lot of people don't don't realize that to do a competition they need to practice a whole different ball game. It's a whole different meal they have to practice. Nice and thin, but still have your structure there, still have your apex there, still have your side walls completely straight. Um, and what a lot of people don't realise is it's a lot to do with things being concise as well. So even if you're doing your smile lines, they don't need to be like overly deep. As long as it's a defined smile line and all the smile lines are concise, then you'll still get the marks for it. Um, it's, I think a lot of people just think they have to do these amazing big smile lines. And yes, if you have a model with amazing long fingers, amazing long nail plates and nail beds, then yeah, that's possible to do that. But if you don't, then you're not going to get that effect unless you use like a cover pink which in some competitions you're, you're allowed to do and in some competitions you're not allowed to do. So a lot's to do with reading your rules and making sure that you know all your rules off by heart. And my best advice to anybody is read your rules, read them again, practice to the rules and if in doubt, always ask the person that wrote the rules. Go back to the organiser and say to them, please explain this to me. Mm -hmm. They're happy to do that. Totally happy to do that. That's what they're there for. They're like your middleman between you and the judge. So they know the rules inside out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's always better to double check um, all your rules. That's it's such great advice. I know um, Karen, one of the admin of our group, is going to be a model um, for an upcoming show. And she has tattoos on her arms. And one of the rules are is your model can't have any tattoos on her arms. And so just today she said, I do still get to be a model, but I have to wear a long sleeve shirt. So, I mean, even though, you know, and sometimes we can't travel with models. It's too expensive for us to pay for ourselves, our model, the motel, the food, the airfare, everything. And so sometimes you're at a whim of calling somebody else. And I think you and I had talked about this, about, you know, setting up people saying, hey, um, I, I'm going to need a model when I get there. And this is the type of nail that I'm looking for or whatever. So sometimes you don't even know what you're getting into. But you do have to know your rules or even as something as simple as tattoos on the arms could knock you out. Yeah, definitely. And um, what I say to a lot of girls as well is to make sure if you have any distinguishing marks at all below the elbow, it's to cut, well, so from there down, um, mm -hmm. is to cover them. Tattoos, cover them with makeup, put a band aid on them, you know, anything like that just to cover them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, bracelets if they have an, you know, a wrist one or something. Yeah. 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 And cover them up because it's in your best interest to have no distinguishing marks. But as you said, if I called you and said, Amy, hey, I'm coming to, when's the next competition? Let's see, Orlando, I need two models. Can you get me them? And you'd be like, sure, Chase. But then yeah. when I get there, I'm like, oh, am I stars? Right, so being prepared, have your kit already packed. That's no problem. I've got Band-Aid there. I can cover that. I've got makeup there. I can cover that. Make sure you take all your jewellery off, watches, all that sort of thing. Another great tip as well is um, if your model can be all dressed in black with no distinguishing logos or anything like that on as well. It's really good because sometimes when the, the hands go through, you can still see parts of clothing and things. So it's always better just to have them in black with no distinguishing clothing or anything like that on. And it just makes things a lot easier. Um, you know, when when they're going through the judging process. 
Yeah, and that's great advice. I think another thing that helped me afterwards is, um, you know, when you have so much anxiety, when it, well, for me, I, I've i learned that I'm not a good competitor. I'm a great teacher. I'm a great supporter. I'm your biggest cheerleader, but I can't do the pressure. And, you know, I do this every day, but there's something about the competition side that I've never I've never been good at any kind of competition, but um, but afterwards, the judges sheets, when you can go through that and you can meet with these judges, that was the best, the best education that I got was like what you're sharing right now is the judges sharing just little tips and tricks along the way afterwards. And they want to see you succeed. So they do. They share their time doing that. So if you go to a competition, definitely take the time to get your judges sheet, go with the judges and talk to them about what changes you could have made to improve. Yeah, that is definitely one of the biggest things, especially if you want to be a regular on mm -hmm. the competition circuit. It gives you um, really, really good feedback and it allows you to go and improve on what your your technique or where mm -hmm. the area that you've lost marks. A lot of people lose marks for really silly, silly reasons, Amy. Um, you know, not completing a step by step or you know, um, not quite buff into high gloss shine. The polish, as I said earlier on there, going underneath the nail instead of just being on the underside of the side wall, it's gone right under and onto the underneath of the nail. Um, you know, it's, it's silly things that you just, you might have lost the points on. Mm -hmm. And again, consistency. <laughs> if you're yeah. consistent, you you will get the points consistently across the board. Um, and then something like maybe artwork, so just let's say for stiletto nails, for instance, you're going to be um, judged on your, you know, sorry, my brain's not functioning. I, I'm needing a cup of tea, that's what's wrong. My, it's my your mask, morning my, and my night, we're both a little on our end of our. <laughs> my mouth's getting dry, I need my cup of tea, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when you do like a stiletto nail, let's say for instance, you're going to get um, judged on your structure, you're going to get judged on your artwork, and you're going to get judged on your length, your shape, all that sort of thing. You need to look at the score sheets. Some competitions allow you to see the score sheets beforehand. So if you're concentrating, and this ha I see this happen all the time, you're concentrating so hard on your artwork on this stiletto nail and the artwork is mind blowing, but it's only worth a certain amount of points. Right. And because you've done this amazing artwork that everybody's like, whoa, the structure's gone. Yeah. So you need to keep the structure there. You need yeah. to get that correct. And then if you don't do as such elaborate and artwork on it you're still going to get the points for the artwork but you're going to gain the points in the structure mm -hmm. so the best um, advice is break that down as you practice the competition break it down and have a look at where the points are and you can say to yourself well if I can gain x amount of points here x amount of points there and x amount of points there don't throw your eggs all in the one basket yeah. it's a bit like a pink and white people go on about smile lines and they have these amazing smile lines but they've let their structure go mm -hmm. yeah. so the points will come down there so it's looking at how many points you're aiming for for each section that the judges are looking for you do that then you've got a better chance overall because yeah. it's concise of winning when i remember the very first time i went and competed it was in rapid city um and I, I remember that when somebody along the way had told me that to make all my nails even from cuticle to fridge on all the way across and then the thumb measure them even out. And I was like, OK, so I made sure that if you held any of my nails up to another, each other, that they were even. And when the judges sheet, when it was done, they had taken an orange wood stick and they had held it in the, the nail to the free edge and they had measured them and they were even on the lengthwise. They were even from cuticle to end, but they were not at all even the way that they judged it. And so I think I must have misunderstood what they said. But I took it so 
literal. And that was actually one of the things I got marked down on. And here I was making sure it was perfect. And so it's interesting, the things that we hear from other competitors and things that we hear from people in the industry. But the reality is, is like what you said, if you can go look at those judge sheets and see what they're judging on and how they judge, that's going to get you so much farther is getting the facts. Wow. And so yeah, so thanks for opening up and sharing a lot of that information because I think we need that so much. And uh, not everybody's always open to share. <laughs> I'm always here, Amy, and I've I've always said to everybody, you know, if you've got any questions, ask me. That's what I'm there for. Um, you know, it's part of my job to make sure the competitors have a fair and even playing field. Mm -hmm. um, and that they understand the rules and regulations. And if they don't, then they need to come and they ask whoever, you know, the organizer is, um, and they should get the correct information that way. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tracy. I appreciate that. Um, hey, I was going through some notes and you have a fabulous mantra that you live by. Would you mind sharing that with everybody? Oh, my stars. Now, I actually put this in writing. I think it was maybe around about 2014 or 2015 because it's something I always have done from an early age, not just like recently or any other time. And I've always lived by it because I just feel that's me as a person. Um, so my mantra is like, you never ever stop learning as much as possible. In this industry, you continually learn, so you have to keep learning. So never stop learning as much as possible. Surround yourself with people who know more than you do. Yeah. Be humble and respect those who came before you. But at the same time, reach back to help the ones that are coming up behind you. I love it. Every time I hear that, it gives me the goosebumps. So I know that it just touches home. Oh yeah. My it's, I mean, I always give back to the industry, but I like to think I do. <laughs> Whether I do or not, that's for everybody else to perceive. You're doing it right now. <laughs> but um, I always like to be there and available to help people. Mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier on, I have so much respect for the boys, Greg and the Babe, and Lisa and Steve, um, you know, Denise Wright, uh, Rachel Wyatt, all these people, Vicky Peters, all oh my stars, what an absolutely amazing lady. I would give anything to be able to be in her company again, I really would. Um, but yeah, all these wonderful people that were all there and I still put up there in a big pedestal, I still admire them all. Um, but yeah, it's just one of these things that I've, I've always kind of lived by, no matter what I've done. You know, always try your hardest and learn. Like every day is a school day. Just take it in. And if you learn one thing, it doesn't need to be nails. It doesn't need to be anything related to the industry. But if you just learn one new thing every day, then it's been a good day. Every day is a school day. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, I have a, an acrylic workshop that I just did and I started like a week ago or so and I don't know where it came to me. I've never used a sports analogy before, but um, baseball came to me one day when I was talking about nails and I said, you know, um, there's so many players out there that have to practice every single day all year round, but how many of those players hit a home run every single time they're up to bat? Their goal is to get a home run. But yeah. when you break it down, like what you were just saying, our goal is to just get to first base. If we can make it to first base, it takes the coach, it takes a team, it takes all the practice to move us around there so that we can make a score. And if we don't get the right mentors and the right coaches, we don't get the right team with us, are we ever going to get the home run? And if we do, who are we benefiting? And so I don't know why baseball came into there, but I wanted to prove to people that they have to practice every single day. And it might take a lot of sunflower seeds and tobacco to get through it. <laughs> Just like with us, it might take a lot of coffee and wine or whatnot to get through it. But we can practice every day. And it doesn't mean that from beginning of a nail service all the way to the end that we're going to get a home run. But we don't, we got to keep practicing. Just like baseball players, 
their whole goal is to get all these home runs, but how many of them actually can do that? How many can hit it out of the ballpark? And so even when it comes to salon nails, competition nails or whatnot, it takes so much practice. And that some people just have a natural act for it. And that's great. You know, I'm glad that, you know, that, that maybe they've even just been a student and they can go to a competition and they can just hands down beat it. That's amazing. But being able to keep that status is hard as well, because once they've won, they want to continue to win. You don't want to win and then the rest of your career never be able to hit that again. And so I actually liked the idea of people having to work hard and work their way up to be able to hit that home run because it just feels, I don't know, more more accomplished at it. Yeah. And so anyways, I don't know where baseball came from, but it worked. <laughs> no, it's a good analogy. It really is. It kind of fits the brief, doesn't it? Um, mm-hmm. it it's like I as I do, flick through social media um, and I look at girls' as nails, boys' as nails and things, and I think, whoa, like you are just rocking it. Absolutely amazing. But they don't they don't put themselves out there like others do or they, they, they don't go into the competition scene like others do. I, I'm, I don't know if that's they maybe perceive this because we are our own worst critics, let's face it. I don't know if it's we, we perceive ourselves as not being good enough or, you know, I'm not sure the right word I'm looking for here. Help me out, Amy. But, um, uh, but yeah. yeah. And, but, and I look at all the, the, these girls and boys' work and I think, wow. And they blow me out of the park because I think, you are just amazing and why are we not hearing about you so don't be scared competitions are a place to get yourself out there and be noticed by like companies and you know to become educators or ambassadors or you know yet don't be scared to just sit there in the sidelines you you are amazing each and every one of you as i said every time i look i think wow it's just blown me away the work that i see yeah oh it's beautiful and i love i mean i'm a huge nails nail pro scratch me like all of these i'm always on their sites looking to see and you know kind of what's the trend what's going on who's who and and uh, and for tech talk live i like to look at some of the names because i'm like oh i i just interviewed them or i'm gonna look into that person because i can see their passion you know and and i like newbies i like people that are new in the industry that there's no end they can see it like what we still see it as like, look at what I can do now. And I just, I love working on different things. I get irritated. This is probably my biggest pet peeve is when somebody will ask for, you know, constructive criticism on a picture and another person will get on there and say, those notes are too wide or they're too narrow or they're too whatever, short. They need to be a a half and, you know, a nail bed and a half, or those are too long because they can't be twice the nail bed you know what, if we didn't all experiment and we didn't all play around, there wouldn't, there's no rules. This is art and it's whatever the client wants. Look at dragon nails. Whoever played around and created this dragon shape of nails, how many people would have looked at that and say, you can't do that shape. That's unrealistic. That's too sharp. That's too long. It's too wide. It's too whatever. Who cares what the shape is? let the client be happy. And if that's what they wanted, go for it. And so when I see that somebody says, oh, those nails are too wide, I kind of just want to go and delete the comment (laughs) because I'm like, you were not there to know what the appointment was and to know that that client wanted that look. Or maybe the client did and the nails are wider than what they wanted. But who are you to really judge that without asking more of the tech of what their goal was? with that picture and so that's that honestly shaping is always my biggest pet peeve because i think that we need to play more you know look how many shapes i think think that's a lot to do with social media which is my pet peeve is because when people are not face to face um the kind of are a little bit keyboard warrior-y if that makes sense they kind of just say what they think without actually analyzing it first um and you know like you say, finding out a bit more information of what that tech wanted to achieve. But going back to these newbies, do you know what? They are 
so lucky now, so lucky. Like where we were in the past, you know, we had to sit there every day and file nails to high gloss shine manually with a buffer <laughs> and a bit of oil. Now, wow, we've got like nail files, we have hot coat gels, we have finished gels, we have all these amazing things that these techs can use and they have them there to be able to create um, amazing nails a lot faster than we ever did when we had to start practicing. But I think a lot of people tend to forget we've all gone through that process of being a learner. It's a bit like driving, isn't it? You sit there behind the wheel of your car and you're like, oh, get out of my way. And you think, oh, they're a learner. <laughs> and you sometimes forget that they're a learner. They've only been driving for a certain length of time. <laughs> with nails when when people are looking and they're giving their advice they forget that's a learner they've not been doing it for very long well I'm still a learner and I've had mm, years mm. in the industry <laughs> a long time um and I still say I'm a learner I still take class yeah. I love being in a class yeah I enjoy that so yeah. I suppose in our industry we're always learners we all have right ill plates constantly they never come off yeah, and you know, I've never had a set that I just felt like was perfect, or it was, you know, I've had some sets that I really, really like, and but I can always see that tiny bit of room of improvement, or maybe I should have done this, and you know, it, it, I guess that's that side of us that might be a little bit of OCD because our clients love them. Obviously, sometimes we're a little too critical of our own work. Yeah, yeah I would say. We are our own worst enemies, nail techs. We just want to be um, perfectionists. And mm -hmm. we always criticise our own work. And again, it comes back to that's maybe why a lot of people don't do the competition scene, because they simply like think, oh, I'm not good enough, when actually they are, because they don't necessarily see what's there on the competition floor. And they mm -hmm. also think as well that the are going to be competing against like veterans you know and you think oh, I'm going to be up against it you're not you're going to be in your own little group with beginners like yourself when you first do it you're not going to be chucked in there with these guys that have been doing it for a long time mm -hmm. so yeah we are most definitely we're on worst critics um mm -hmm. Yeah, every time we look at an ale, we think, oh, God, I could have done that better. I could have filed that a bit more here. Or that pot, that line's not straight. That polish is a wee bit. Oh, yeah. Nail techs are the worst. The yeah. worst. self yeah. up. Mm -hmm. You know, I was... I was talking not too long ago because I used to be, well, I can't say I used to be, I'm still a crafter, but I've used a lot of that I've used in the nail industry to be able to use on canvas to paint and stuff like that. And it's interesting that I can paint almost anything on a palette this big, but wow. you give me a, a, a palette this big and I struggle painting it because I know how to use dotting tools and find brushes for flowers and like run stroke kind of things and you get me on a bigger palette and a bigger brush it just isn't the same but an artist can sit there and paint on a palette like what we do on a nail and sell it for thousands of dollars we paint on 10 canvases or even just you know accent nails if we want and we charge five dollars <laughs> And file <laughs> it off a month later, and there's no proof of what we did. And so I always tell techs when they talk about their art, I say, you have no idea that you could be a millionaire artist, mm -hmm. but our palette and what we do as a nail tech is our palette is just on a smaller scale. So a lot of times there are techs that will, as they're painting 10, they'll paint a tip. So they'll paint the 11th and then they save that and you know a lot of us take pictures of our work and save it that way but it's amazing but if we can use our craft on a bigger scale how much more money we could possibly bring in through an art gallery no I've never thought about it that way when you think about that yeah maybe the art galleries would like something like flat nail art they would display that what do you think I actually no joke I was traveling and I was in Minnesota and I went into a gallery that was there off of um Oh, we were we went to Rochester, so it was somewhere over by Rochester. When my husband and I went to a gallery, and there was 3D nail art there on tips. No joke, it was a fish thing. 
I remember taking a picture of it going, I don't know who this is, but I think I need to meet them just because I thought it was so cool that it was in an art gallery. Well, that's awesome. Maybe they made some money out of it and selling it on to somebody. Yeah. You never know. It can't yeah. money, but, um, <laughs> the new direction, taking it to art galleries and asking them to display. Yeah, you never know. I mean, there's so many people out there that love unique art. And what we do every single day is top of the line art using multi, you know, mixed medias for that. Sometimes we're using gold leafing, the stones, everything that we do. Um, our artwork is phenomenal what we what we do. I don't know, maybe we should do a side challenge on that, that somebody needs to create um, a canvas that matches nails. We'll put the picture together and we'll do a complete challenge that way. I think I will. I, I'm going to, so I'll get my two of girls on this right now. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, that sounds like a great challenge. You know, once again, this industry is never ending. We can always have an idea and come up with it. And whether it ties into art or we have an idea for, you know, whatever it is, this industry is always changing. And so it keeps it fun and innovative. And it takes quirky ideas like us just coming up with that, that, you know, can put us on something new. <laughs> Do you know, that's how the industry evolves, though, isn't it? Like, it's reinventing itself all the time. Um, I mean, just look at the dipping systems nowadays as well. I remember those being out a long time ago. Yeah. And they were not the best back then. They were so gritty and yeah, but look at how much they've evolved, evolved. Now they're, they're just an amazing product to work with. Um, I still have my issues with it though, about fingers dipping in the pot. Um, yeah, that's still, still a bit of a dodgy area for me. Um, you know, one of the first things we learn as a nail technician, a beauty therapist, cosmetologist, even doctors and nurses, like anybody in the medical industry, never double dip, never put your hands in or your fingers in. Yeah. Yeah. You have dipping systems that we, um, we do that with, but yeah, it's, that's still my thing with them. I'm not a hundred percent on the fence for that great idea, quick, easy. Yeah. When, just... I, when I teach, I make sure that they understand that not only there's a hand washing, but there's also the hand sanitation. And yeah. then once they're at my table and they're sitting down with me, I go to the knuckle. I clean the knuckle down on everything because our fingers touch that. And you know how we constantly rub our finger over their finger to, you know, fill the arch, fill the thinness, fill for any high lows, you know, any of that. And so we need to make sure that that's all completely clean. So I, I always tuck knuckle down. And then if they are doing a dipping system or something like that, then, you know, those are things to look at. You know, that's interesting that you bring that up because one thing that I've always wondered in the nail industry is, you know, for years we could use a bottle of polish on over and over and over on different people, but yet I can't reuse a file in the United States, but yet cuticle oil, um, I can use, you know, well, this isn't cuticle oil, but you can use cuticle oil in a jar and use that on client to client. But really what it comes down to is knowing that your client is clean and not only that they've covered their steps with it, but you've covered the steps on your end as well of making sure, like, like I said, I clean to the knuckle. And so it's just different things over the years that we wonder why they're so strict in some areas and not in others. For instance, another rule that they came out with in, in Wyoming not too long ago is I can have a cup of coffee without a lid and it can be, you know, clean. I can put this in the dishwasher and clean it. But for me to serve a cup of coffee to my client, it has to be in a disposable cup with a lid. Oh. I can't give them a coffee cup, period. And so it, some rules that are so completely strict on it, like we talked about in the beginning, my son, you know, when he was little, used to paint yeah. toners. I swear, I'm going to show him this video and he is going to be like, mom, <laughs> do not talk about me like that anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, so you you can't do that. You can't bring in that side of it. But, you know, it's so just, many different rules, though, isn't there? Like, it's so, as you say, so, so strict on some things and not in others. But again, you, you're licensed over in the States. Um, and I think probably over there, you are the only people that are licensed. Whereas in a lot of different countries, you can just 
set up shop with no knowledge at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, you, you sit and you think to yourself, well, they have all these strict rules and regulations, mm -hmm. but they allow this to happen. So, yeah, it's a bit a two-edged sword, doesn't it? It's, it's, yeah. it's really another thing that yeah. 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 And so we get random inspections a few times a year from state and the health department, and uh, and so obviously you don't know when they're coming, and so you know you just follow the rules all the time. However, in the state of Wyoming, you don't have to be licensed at all or any schooling at all to be a tattoo artist. Mm. Yeah. They work with needles and blood and permanent, you know, everything. But yet there's no regulations on tattooing. But yet to be a nail tech or just a, even a manicure, just to polish fingernails, you would be fully licensed. So it just blows me away. That's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Really bizarre. Yeah. I love it, though. I, I love being able to talk about it to educate people. It's like, like I said, the nerdy nail knowledge when they come in and, you know, like if they see my inspection sheet, because we keep we have to keep it out for our clients to see that we were inspected and, you know, what they graded us and stuff like that. And so um, they'll see that and I'll be like, I know, isn't it crazy? Everything that they inspect us on, you know, like to make sure the shingles on the roof outside are, you know, there's no holes in your roof all the way through and every light bulb is working in your salon. I said, but yeah, I could give you a tattoo. <laughs> I have no education in that all. But I can totally give you a tattoo, and there's no regulations on that at all. And they're, wow. they're really by that. <laughs> That's just mind blowing. Yeah. How is that over there? Do you do you find little things like that? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a bit a bit like that here. Um, we're usually compared to tattoo artists, so so they say here that anything that's skin penetration, yeah. Um, which I don't get with files and stuff like that because they well yeah if it's a brand new file generally you know an odd time you'll you'll maybe catch the client with it I tend to take the edges off of mine first but that's the client's own file you know it's not going on another client but we're not actually piercing skin we're not so I don't know why um we're sort of in the same category as tattoo artists um so yeah, that's a bizarre one for me, like over in the States where, again, they're so strict, mm -hmm. they allow that to happen without a license. And yet here we are compared to them, but yeah. we're not actually, you know, doing anything to the skin that's going to open it. So yeah, I think somewhere some somebody has got that a bit round the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, we've talked numerous times on if there was a way to be kind of a universal education and then, you know, just a universal baseline, like Milady is the um, the book that we've used in schooling. And it's the same book that they used in schooling 26 years ago when I got licensed. And, and so some of the things have changed slightly, but still you have to polish a nail with three strokes at state board. And I always still laugh because I'm like, what if you're in the salon and you're like, oh no, I've only learned to polish with three strokes, but I need that fourth stroke, like just one more stroke and this would be perfect. Like you're not gonna hold back and not do the fourth stroke in the salon. So some of the stuff that we even learned in school, I still kind of roll my eyes at because some of it really still doesn't make sense all these years later. I understand their reasoning of being able to understand how to use the brush flatten the brush out and drag along strokes. I understand the concept of it, but really when you're in the real world of polishing, it might not take, it might take life. It might take six. <laughs> in real life in the salon as well, you think about it back in the G, um, when we learned, well, when I learned in the land of the dinosaur, still <laughs> Roman land at that point. Um, <laughs> I was learning the three bead method. And obviously white on first and then you're pink. And I always remember the first time I sat down with Greg Salo and he showed me reverse application. He whacked that bead on there and he just chucked the white on the top. I was like, what? No. And I was just like, that's so awful looking. But when he filed it and everything, I was like, what? Yeah. And then I was, but do you know what, Amy? It took me... I don't know how many months to get that round my head because I was taught the traditional way, three beads. Yeah. So it took me a long time to get round my head. 
just you know, I can still hear Greg. I can still hear Greg in my ear and I saying, whack it on, whack it on. And I'm like, oh, I can't whack it on, I can't whack it on. You know, and I'm like, oh my, my stars. But again, you look at the involvement in the industry um, and how much easier that is now for people. Um, so yeah, like it is, it's, it's very, very different when you look at the, the how things move on within our industry. But yeah, the, the, the girls and boys nowadays, what, in the salon, as you say, you do your three, no, you don't. I just do one, two, maybe a fourth, maybe a fifth, or maybe even do another coat. But yeah. even doing acrylic as well, let's bring it back to doing that. There's a lot of salons out there now for speed, use one beat method. Again, mm. I've got Greg in my ear, whack it on, <laughs> whack it on. <laughs> but that's not something you're taught in nail school. It's something you learn when you're out in the big bad world and you're learning to service your clients and service them effectively mm -hmm. um, and, and better ways of servicing. But, yeah, there's still a lot of methods that they teach in school now that were taught when I did it all those many years ago. And you think to yourself, you know, as much as it's a good grounding for the text that's coming through and it's a good base, they they need to give them a bit more nowadays because there are all these amazing techniques and when it, they are in the salon they have to learn to do things more efficiently or better as you say oh i've been taught three i'll do my three strokes but it doesn't look right and sometimes it's hard when you've been taught a certain way you think that that's the correct way to do it there's not a correct way and there's not a wrong way it's whatever works for you whatever yeah. Whatever fits into your salon life, your customers' lives, or whatever works for you. There's not a definite right way or a definite wrong way of doing it. There's the yeah. middle ground. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so so true. I I I think I bring this up quite a bit. People might be tired of hearing about it, but I really do stress that when people get into a product line, if they choose that they want to do acrylic, they need to buy three trial kits from three different companies and understand that there's not a bad company out there, but they yeah. all have different ratios. They all have different techniques that make each one of them work. And what happens is you don't realize maybe naturally you're a person that pat, 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 pat. So therefore don't get a self-leveling product, get something mm -hmm. that works with you that can make you pat in one bead and, and move it out. But if you're a person that is more mellow and you find that you put it on and you wait a moment and do it, then find a self-leveling the one that works for you because you're going to realize that works better with your technique, but you don't know till you've tried three. And mm -hmm. so no matter what company, even when it comes to gel polish or so many different types, they're not all created equal. So therefore, three different companies that are in your area that are easy for you to purchase and try those and find out which one's best for you not what you're best for what company because our techniques are so different and, and the, the products themselves you know it's always best to do a conversion with somebody that's using that product the educators because there are certain little tweaks from one product to another again back in the land of the dinosaur we only had three products we did. We only had three products. We had Creative, we had NSI, and we had Easy Flow. And then Young Nails came on the scene and it was like, whoa, what's this? And now when I think about the choices that the techs have, it is mind blowing. You have all these, as you say, amazing products. They all are amazing in their own right. But if you as a tech have not taken a conversion with that class or with that product, you can't expect that to work for you unless you know the correct ratios and how to pick the bead up with that product. That product might like to work wetter than you normally work, or it might like to work drier than you normally work. So yeah, when you see techs asking, oh, my product's not working for me, I'm having a lift in, I'm having, it could be your prep. Well, yes, it could be your prep, but it could be the fact that you're not actually using the product effectively. So go and have a little class with somebody, ask a tech who uses it, can I come sit with you one day? Or would you mind just going over it with me? A lot of us will say, yeah, that's no problem. Let, let's sit down and I'll, I'll have a look at what you do from beginning to end. And then, you know, say, right, this is where I think you need to do this or mm -hmm. you need to do that. But 
yeah, the, the, the choices that they have now are so amazing. Mm -hmm. And as you said, every single product out there now in its own right is fabulous. You just need to know how to use it. That's all. Absolutely. And these companies want you to use their product. That's oh, why they all create a website and they all have said, every single person that I've brought on Tech Talk and I've talked in my entire career, call me, email me, message me, whatever it is. They want you to use the product. So they're going to put an educator with you that's going to teach you how to use it. Because if you quit using their product, they quit making the money. So they yeah. want you to use their product. They want you to be educated with their product and they offer the education for free. You just have to call the company. Yeah, so true. Um, I uh, greatly apologize to you, Tracy. I try to keep these tech talks about an hour and I've been sitting here agreeing with you going, yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. And we've been on for an hour and 15 minutes. No. <laughs> yes. So I'm really sorry that I went way over, but you have so much knowledge to share and you really know how to explain it well for us to understand. And when it comes to competitions, nails, salon nails, just life in general, you obviously know how to how to share some of the great good stuff. And so well, I thank you for having me, Amy. And thanks to the, the ladies or uh, everybody that tuned in. And I'm sorry we didn't get to any questions for yeah. that. And you know, honestly, there was just a lot of hellos and you're a great educator and stuff like that. And people are great. And I didn't see any questions come up. I think they were probably like me just listening, going, yes. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that's so sweet. But I think we should maybe schedule another one, maybe for a few weeks' time, because I might have something exciting for you. Oh, we get to be an exclusive? Mm, I think so, yeah. Maybe. I love that idea. So you just call me whenever you want to come on, and we can do an exclusive VIP access to, to Tech Talk. Yeah. I like to share my secrets with my friends. Oh, well, I like <laughs> That's exciting. Yes, absolutely. You can call me anytime you want and uh, we can come on. Oh, of course, you're way in my future. So you're going to know about a lot of things before I do. <laughs> well, this is why I'm thinking you would be a good lady to share my secret with because obviously I'm um, in the future and, you know, people will just be waking up or whatever to, to you or, yeah. So Absolutely. you anytime you have something to share, even if there's just something, you know, um, personal that you even want to get on and share, you're more welcome to. Absolutely. Oh, thanks, Amy. And yeah. just thanks again to um, Tech Talk Worldwide for Thank you having me. It was very kind of you all to say to have a chat with you this morning. So. I love it. Absolutely love it. You know, when I first started this, I honestly thought it was just going to be members of the groups that I was in. I had no clue that by reaching out to people like yourself, that you guys would share your time and your knowledge with us. I really, I guess we look at some of our industry leaders, you guys are just too busy. And why would you stop to be able to share your knowledge with, you know, us? And, um, and I'm blown away still today the people that immediately when I say, like messaging you a few months ago, Tracy, would you be interested in coming on Tech Talk Live? Absolutely, yes, I mean, without a doubt. And you yeah. do it, and it still, it blows my mind every day that I get to do this, and, oh. and I thank you guys. You know, you're doing a grand job, Amy, and I've watched quite a few of the, the Tech Talk Lives, and yeah, they're, they're fun, and exactly. everybody seems to enjoy them. Um, they're very informative one way or another. Um, and yay, keep doing what you're doing, girlfriend. Thanks. You're doing amazing. <laughs> well, well, Tracy, thanks again for your time. I appreciate that. And for all of you guys that are watching in, you know that I went live with uh, the Nail Nanny on Saturday. And um, next week, I go live with Daria Keenan, who is an amazing artist. Maybe by then, I'll have something put together about a challenge of us painting a canvas and a nail and putting an art gallery and seeing how much money we can make off of our art gallery um, submits. So um, I think I really am going to turn that into some sort of a challenge. I love the idea of being. Able to step outside the box. Good things come out. 
And I do have Greg Schoon that's going to be rescheduled. As you guys know that I've gotten sick and obviously my voice is still an aftermath of that. And so um, as the weeks come up, we have Tony Lee and we have Kirsty Meekin and we have a lot of uh, superstars as well in the nail industry, as well as some newbies coming up and sharing their experiences as well. So I thank you guys for your time. Thank you for being active in our group. Another thing that we just started this week is called TTW, hashtag TTW365. And what we are doing is recognizing one person that submits their picture into our group on a daily basis where you get a well-worthy certificate recognition because how many times do we want to be recognized and unless you do a competition you don't tend to get a certificate but it's nice to be able to be recognized in the nail industry by your peers and and kind of picked out of a group and saying yeah, I did those. And that's what we're doing is we're rewarding you for submitting and, and keeping Tech Talk the number one, um, you know, go to source for education and for fun and uh, positive vibes. So I appreciate all of you for, for that. And that's our way of giving back to you is giving you some certificates as well and many, many challenges to come. So keep your eye out on us because we have a lot coming up. And it sounds like maybe in a couple of weeks we'll have an exclusive with Tracy of something else coming up. Well, I can't share all my secrets on one go with you, Amy. I need to keep something there for the next time. <laughs> Once again, thank you for your time, and I appreciate you so much. Uh, no worries. Thanks very much for having me. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.